Japan up close. So I've written a number of books on Japan, but I decided it was time to write a book that really explained the origins of Abe Shinzo's transformational strategy for Japan. Uh, the origins in Japanese history and also in um, more recent times. Um, and the strategy uh, that Abe Shinzo uh, pulled together uh, in his second term as prime minister was not completely original uh, to him. Um, strengthening the U.S.-Japan alliance by recognizing the right of collective self-defense, um, strengthening ties with other maritime democracies like India and Australia, um, leading on TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. These were ideas that the previous uh, outgoing government, uh, uh, the last deputy, uh, uh, the last Democratic Party of Japan, uh, Prime Minister uh, Noda, also tried to do, but he just didn't have the political support or the political acumen to get it done. He didn't have the mandate. So Abe came into power with a mandate to put Japan back on the map, to restore Japan's uh, throw weight in international relations. Um, he pulled together ideas that had been there before. Some of his ideas, like a quad, a US-Japan-Australian quad, actually were ideas first floated by Commodore Matthew Perry in the 1850s or by the American strategist Alfred Thayer Mahan in the 1890s. So the ideas were not all new, but Abe-san had the discipline, he had the perseverance, and he had the political skills to organize the Japanese government uh, and to pull together allies and partners to make this grand strategy the grand strategy of a new era for Japan. It, it basically replaces what we knew as the Yoshida Doctrine, which really guided Japan's role in the world since Prime Minister Yoshida Shigeru first controlled uh, the Japanese government as premier in the post-war era. And the Yoshida Doctrine was about maximizing economic growth and minimizing risk in the international system. Abe-san's strategy is about Japan taking more risk taking on more burdens, taking on more responsibilities, but leading more. And indeed, the strategy really did um, lead to um, Japan being marked as uh, the upholder of the liberal order in Asia. It came at a time when the U.S. was in some turmoil with the Trump years, um, and Abe-san really stepped up and led in the creation of what he called a free and open Indo-Pacific, uh, a concept that is adopted by the Biden administration, before that, the Trump administration by Australia, and you hear free and open Indo being used in Southeast Asia, in Europe, in India. He really transformed not only Japan's way of thinking about how to compete with China and preserve order in Asia, but how the whole world began to think about it. Um, and for that, he was a remarkable figure, the most consequential Japanese prime minister of modern times, I would argue. And uh, that's why I wrote the book. And I think uh, with his tragic murder, um, much of the world, and I assume most of them haven't read my book, um, saw the same thing and came to the same conclusion about Abe-san's legacy. You know, before he was murdered, um, former Prime Minister Abe was pushing uh, the government, pushing his uh, successor, Kishida-san, to do more. You know, uh, Abe-san said Japan should uh, consider hosting tactical nuclear weapons uh, to counter the Chinese and North Korean threats. He called on the U.S. to move from strategic ambiguity about our commitment to Taiwan's defense, to strategic clarity that we would defend Taiwan under any circumstances. He really was pushing the envelope. And I think for that reason, some people may assume that Kishida-san was somehow softer on China or needed prodding. But if you look at what Kishida has done as prime minister, it absolutely continues the same trajectory started by Prime Minister Abe. Um, in, in some areas, in fact, Kishida-san may be even tougher on China than Abe-san. In particular, in the area of democracy and human rights, Kishida-san is a lot more outspoken. He's created a human rights special advisor in the cabinet um, and is taking on China in the ideational or in the human rights or ideological realm in a way that Abe-san didn't. Kishida-san is also quite outspoken and has a long tie with Taiwan. So, I'm not sure that it would be accurate to say that somehow Kishida has been softer than Abe. He comes from a faction that historically has been a bit softer, but Kishida himself, I think, largely um, is following the trajectory set by Abe, and not surprisingly, because he was, after all, Abe-san's foreign minister for, for many years. The, the thing that I think marks uh, Abe's final years in office um, was an effort to stabilize relations with China. You know, Abe-san 
had to fight hard against China. The Chinese tried to isolate him, tried to undercut him. But Abe San shored up Japan's ties, not only with the U.S., but with Europe, with Southeast Asia, and basically outflanked Xi Jinping and demonstrated to Beijing that China would have to deal with Japan as an equal and with respect. And he succeeded. Um, the Chinese pressure on Japan and on the East China Sea and on Taiwan has increased. So the military pressure is still there. But diplomatically, Beijing has backed off a bit. Um, and so in many ways, Abe San succeeded. And this is a trajectory the U.S., as it competes with China, might uh, emulate. We have organized the U.S. government, dysfunctional as we sometimes are, uh, to compete with China on technology, on diplomacy, on defense. Uh, the U.S. has not stepped up on trade policy. That's a huge failing. But in general, the U.S. mood, the congressional mood, the administration consensus, the public mood is to compete against China. What the Biden administration has not figured out yet is how to do what Abe San did, use competition to bend relations with China towards a more stable equilibrium, a more productive relationship. Very, very difficult with Xi Jinping. But Abe San tried and had some success. And that aspect of his strategy is something I think the Biden administration would do well to study. Well, I think um, Kishida-san has performed well for Japan and well for the democratic world in his very robust uh, and tough response to uh, Vladimir Putin's um, brutal and unlawful invasion of Ukraine. And watching how Japan and, and North America and Europe have come together in the G7, um, I've been impressed and I've been reminded um, of my time in the uh, Bush administration. I worked in the White House, but I would often go over to the State Department to have meetings with Condoleezza Rice uh, or Colin Powell, Secretary of, of State in those days. And my favorite meeting room in the State Department was outside of the Secretary of State's main office. And the table was the table that was used for the Williamsburg G7 summit in the 1980s. And they had brass placards for where each leader sat. Um, Ronald Reagan, Margaret Thatcher, Helmut Kohl of Germany, uh, Nakasone Yasuhiro of Japan. These were really powerful um, figures in world history. Um, and they really took on uh, Soviet expansion uh, with solidarity and with resolve. But it didn't start out that way. Um, when the NATO countries were negotiating arms control with Russia, and in particular, um, intermediate nuclear forces, tactical nuclear weapons, they initially reached an agreement with Moscow where Moscow would just move those missiles over the Ural Mountains away from NATO. And Nakasone, as prime minister, said, wait a minute, you are moving the threat from NATO to East Asia. You're taking the nuclear weapons from Russia's front yard to their backyard, and that threatens us. So Nakasone really, for the first time in the G7, as a Japanese leader in the 1980s, um, shaped the global strategic uh, direction of the major democracies. And I think of that when I sit at that table in the State Department with his brass placard there. And I think Kishida-san, and before him Abe, uh, and Koizumi and other leaders of Japan have done the same thing again. But it's particularly striking in the past um, few months because of the Ukraine invasion, because of the Russian threat to global peace. And, you know, in those days, in the 80s, uh, Americans refer to this G7 grouping as the West, but Japan's leadership is so pronounced and other American allies and partners like Korea and Singapore are stepping up in such a robust way that the term the West doesn't really apply anymore. Um, it's really the East, it's really Asian uh, countries and Asian allies and Asian democracies that are stepping up and demonstrating that even though Putin's attack happened on the other, other side of the world as Foreign Minister Hayashi and Prime Minister Kishida have stated so clearly, this is a direct threat to the entire international system and to Asia. And I think this demonstrates Japan's leadership on a global scale, helps to pull together solidarity in the G7 and among the leading countries of the world. Uh, but it also helps Japan and helps the Indo-Pacific uh, because it demonstrates to China that any use of force against Taiwan, against Japan, against the Philippines and the South China Sea, um, could open China to similar blowback, to similar consequences. Nobody really expects that NATO will send military forces to the defense of Japan or Korea or Taiwan. And even if they did, it would be the British or the Dutch and it would be mostly symbolic. But the geopolitical weight and the geoeconomic weight of Europe, particularly for China, is enormous. Um, and if Europe imposed even 
limited sanctions on China because of aggression in the Western Pacific, it would be quite devastating for China. So by stepping up, um, not, not just Kishida, but uh, but the Australian leaders, the Korean leaders, they are reinforcing security in the Indo-Pacific by demonstrating there is a global coalition of leading democracies that will punish aggressors. And I think that reinforces stability uh, in Japan's neighborhood. So it was the right thing for Kishida to do for global uh, stability and in terms of Japan's global leadership, but it was smart strategy to reinforce deterrence, dissuasion, and stability in the Western Pacific in Japan's own neighborhood, just like Nakasone did in the 1980s, pulling together the G7 for global solidarity, but also to reinforce security in Asia. Well, I think some of the most significant uh, new initiatives in the next uh, five years of defense strategy for Japan, which will be um, uh, consummated at the end of this year in the first national security strategy since Abe's in 2013, which was, by the way, Japan's first national security strategy document ever, uh, held up very, very well, but it, it, the world has changed. So it's going to, uh, the new national security strategy will cast the broad framework for Japan's approach to the world. And then uh, the national defense program guidelines and the midterm defense plan. So defense buildup planning and defense strategic planning for the next five years. It's a big deal. And it's the first new chapter since Abe um, that will mark how Japan uh, shapes its security environment and restores deterrence against a, a China that is rapidly expanding its military power, uh, aligns more with the U.S. and other like-minded states. There's some bold new things in this planning document, at least expected to be in it. Um, the pledge uh, by Prime Minister Kishida to substantially increase Japan's defense spending. The ruling Liberal Democratic Party has put the marker even further forward, calling for 2% of GDP defense spending in the next five years, by 2027. Right now, Japan's defense spending is less than 1%. Um, if you count it the way NATO does, including the Coast Guard, it's maybe 1.2%. But we're talking about an LDP plan to increase defense spending by uh, 40 or $50 billion a year, almost doubling Japan's defense budget. May not happen, but, but, but a big defense increase would be something. And given Japan's fiscal situation, it's going to be an intense fight with the powerful Ministry of Finance on how you pay for it. Do you issue new debt? Do you cut corners elsewhere? It's a big, big, bold move, but but complicated. Other things people are looking at are the um, likely introduction of um, what is being called counter-strike, essentially ballistic missiles that can hit enemy bases, command and control ports, uh, if they're trying to attack Japan. Um, while the discussion is very generic, uh, we're probably talking China, North Korea, maybe even Russia. Uh, Japan has never had that offensive capability in the post-Cold War era. I think in the U.S. there's support for that, but that also raises some, some questions. Uh, how do you do command and control? Um, who decides when to launch? Is it Japan? Well, can Japan actually hit targets without U.S. Uh, intelligence and satellite surveillance? Um, will the U.S. want a system where Japan can unilaterally hit China, North Korea, and then all of a sudden the U.S. sees itself in an escalating war? There's support for this in the U.S., but there are some complicated mechanical and legal and doctrinal and organizational questions to be worked out. And there are other things that, that will be um, will, will be will be quite innovative and new. You know, potentially strengthening Japan's industrial base and international cooperation on um, procurement, development, testing, design of fighter aircraft and submarines. Um, further integrating Japan into uh, the U.S.-Japan alliance, but also with other partners like Australia uh, and potentially Korea. Um, these are big new steps for Japan. They'll cost money. Um, frankly, they will involve uh, Japan having less autonomy because when you integrate with other allies and partners, you are going together, not alone. And so these are big fiscal and bureaucratic and ideological um, steps. Um, but the external threat environment and the Japanese public's recognition that more needs to be done uh, leads me to conclude that more will be done. The question is how much, how quickly, um, and um, how effectively. So big, big moment. You know, I, I, I get the sense myself that in 2015, after Abe-san passed this landmark sweeping reform of Japanese defense policy in the diet, including reinterpreting Article 9 to um, recognize the right of collective self-defense to do coalition operations with the U.S. or Australia or others. That was a big, big move. There were protests outside of the diet. The public barely supported it. 
uh, newspaper editorials generally did. Um, he won. He won. There's 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 no opposition of note anymore. The opposition parties accept it. The public expects that this is now what will be done. But there was a bit of a lull after 2015. I think the Abe government, maybe Abe on himself, were exhausted. And you didn't hear any big major defense reforms after that for a while. Well, here we go again. 2022, seven years later, the next five-year plan, big ambitious moves that are good for Japan security, good for the U.S., good for the Indo-Pacific. What's interesting is the debate is not anymore, is Japan a dangerous country? Now the debate is, will Japan do enough um, to um, further contribute to security as we've seen over the last decade? So the NATO summit was very significant, uh, unprecedented really, because of the level of representation from, from Asia, from, from leading democracies and US allies, uh, not only Japan, but Korea and Australia and New Zealand. And um, that's a good thing because the threats to international stability, um, whether it's Russian invasion of Ukraine or Iran's threat in the Middle East or, or, or China's ambitions in Asia, um, are going to affect the entire uh, international system, the entire global economy. And so demonstrating that um, NATO and Europe, that the transatlantic alliances and the transpacific alliances have the ability to come together on crises, regardless of which part of the world they happen in, is a powerful deterrent message, as I noted, to would-be um, aggressors. Um, but beneath that is a harsh reality, which is the U.S. Um, has finite resources, and it now has to uh, reinforce deterrence in NATO, which costs money and involves troops and involves army and air force. At the same time, it's trying to pivot to the Indo-Pacific and shore up deterrence there, which involves Navy, Marine Corps, and Air Force. So there will be fierce fights in the Pentagon and in the Congress about how you resource, because to some extent, the military capabilities are finite, and the U.S. does have to make a choice uh, between the transatlantic and transpacific challenges. I, I think the consensus in Washington is that the transpacific challenges should take priority, but the tensions now in those two requirements are going to increase thanks to Vladimir Putin. So in a way that makes the diplomatic piece even more important um, because if we can dissuade aggression by demonstrating solidarity among global democracies, among, among American allies, transatlantic and transpacific, that lowers the danger of aggression. And we, we are lucky that we are having progress on the diplomatic side to help at least in part offset the challenges to our defense uh, commitments. Um, and Japan has been an absolutely central part of that. Um, the Japan I studied uh, as a graduate student in the 1980s was a Japan that people dismissed as you know a country that did checkbook diplomacy or a reactive power, you know, or a power that was, you know, only economic. Um, Japan got very, very little credit uh, for um, diplomacy in the 80s or 90s. I think that's just changing in the most dramatic ways. The G7 was fractured in the Trump years, but Abe, as prime minister, pulled the G7 together. The TPP could have collapsed when the U.S. withdraw under President Trump. But Abe San, with help from Australia, New Zealand, and Canada, held it together. And on technology competition with China on 5G, um, Japan has stepped up and brokered negotiations and strategic dialogue, not only in a trans-Pacific context, but he's been the broker and Japan has been the broker between the US and Europe. And if we are going to hold together what we used to call the West, which we now should call the free world or the leading democracies or the leading uh, like-minded states. If we're going to hold it together, Japan is going to be the key. It's going to be the linchpin. Um, and commensurate with what you'd expect from the world's third largest economy. Japan's diplomatic power is catching up to its economic power. And in some areas, it's surpassing it. This doesn't mean Japan's diplomacy is perfect. There are big homework assignments undone. I think for those of us in Washington, the most glaring one is the Japan-Korea relationship. Uh, Japan also has a lot of work to do to keep its economic weight up. Uh, Abenomics succeeded in part, but uh, growth is sluggish and uh, reform, restructuring, dynamism in the Japanese economy is still going to be necessary. So I don't want to sound Pollyannish, but I would say that Japan's diplomatic impact uh, is really catching up to, in some areas, really surpassing Japan's status as the third largest economy in the world. Um, and a lot of that is Abe's legacy, but it's also a lot of um, scholars, diplomats, business leaders, 
um, politicians who've really spent the tough years Japan faced since the collapse of the bubble, the 1990s, the so-called lost, lost decade, spent a lot of time thinking about how to come back. And under Abe, Japan came back. And the rest of us need Japan to keep at it. I first came to know former Prime Minister Abe Shinzo uh, in 2001. I was in the White House working on the National Security Council staff. And Abe-san was the Deputy Chief Cabinet Secretary. Um, he went with Prime Minister Kuizumi to meet President Bush at uh, Camp David in Maryland in June 2001. And Prime Minister Kuizumi told President Bush, this man here, Abe Shinzo, is going to be Prime Minister. So President Bush and the National Security Advisor asked me to keep in close touch with Abe as we worked on issues. And we became one of the channels that supported the close Bush-Kuizumi relationship. And I spoke with him frequently on the phone or in person, including after he um, stepped out as prime minister. So on a personal level, he was very kind to me and my wife and family, um, a very warm person. You can tell that from the reaction of leaders like uh, Narendra Modi in India or um, Tony Abbott in Australia. You know, his counterparts who saw him not just as the leader of Japan, but as a, as a friend. So there's a lot of hurt and loss around the world and shock at, at, at how this happened. Um, but, but as a scholar and a historian of the U.S.-Japan alliance, um, I also took note and really was quite gratified to see how much commentary around the world praised Abe-san for his legacy, for um, not just um, charting a new path for Japan that would be more proactive, that would accept more risk in the international system, that would step up and lead with creating the free and open Indo-Pacific strategy, uh, sustaining the Trans-Pacific Partnership, um, infrastructure and quality infrastructure to compete with Belt and Road. Not only was he a thought leader for Japan's foreign policy, but his ideas were adopted. You know, the Trump and Biden administrations now use the free and open Indo-Pacific framework Abe-san introduced. And from Australia to uh, Southeast Asia to Europe, now talk about an Indo-Pacific. So he really left a powerful legacy for Japan's foreign policy, but for how the whole world thinks about how to compete with China uh, while coexisting with China. Because at the end of the day, Abe-san, in his final years as prime minister, was not only seeking to counter Chinese revisionism, but also to find a way to cooperate and work with China. That was a hard formula, and that's the next lesson the rest of us have to learn from him. So his legacy has been really acknowledged. It's very, very powerful. You know, those of us who've been with him or studied him know that when he came to power in 2006 or when he came back in 2012, there's a lot of alarm and a lot of criticism that he might be some right wing nationalist. That's not the Abe that the world remembers, and rightly so. He really contributed to our prosperity and to our security. Japan up close.